from the number one best-selling author of Life Rescripted. You're now tuning in to the Year of Purpose podcast. I'm Zephan Moses Blacksburg. Michael Mojaleski is a correspondent and co-host for Earthwise, the anchor TV show on the Outdoor Life channel, featuring all the powers and nuances of the natural world. Michael is a roving correspondent for the national radio show, The Good Life, reporting from the field on his adventures all over the world. He grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, where his father played professional football with the Browns. For the past 12 years, he has traveled to 40 countries around the world on assignment for national publications. After living dateless on the wild island, upon returning to civilization, Michael was startled to find he was chosen Cosmopolitan Magazine's Bachelor of the Month and Alaska Men Magazine's Centerfold Story, keeping his pants and parka on but getting a staple through his navel. After receiving 5,000 letters from women around the world, he married one of the correspondents. Michael's latest book, Wildlife, The Misadventures of Cosmo Bachelor, is attracting rave reviews from everyone except his mother. When not traveling on assignment, Michael enjoys the mountain climbing, marathon running, sea kayaking, surfing, and exploring his two favorite places in the world. And Michael, in a second here, I'll get you to pronounce them because I know they're in Alaska and Africa, but I probably can't pronounce these names for anything. So Michael, thanks for being here. And uh, how about we'll start with your two favorite places because I can't pronounce them. Oh, uh, Zephan, thank you so much for having me on. It's an absolute honor. I'm really thrilled. Yeah. So what are these places that you uh, love the most? The two most beautiful places in the world, Tracy Arm Fjord up in Alaska, and then in East Africa in the country of Tanzania. Uh, my second favorite place is the Ngorongoro Crater. Very cool. And so I'm sure that there's, I mean, you've been to 40 countries, so you've really seen quite a bit here. Let me ask, how does one get started in this crazy life of adventure? I mean, I read your bio when we first started talking, and I just, I couldn't believe that this is how someone lived their life. Like, how does one grow up to be like you when they're older? Well, I, I once heard an expression that the happiest adults are doing for a living what they did playfully as a child. And in that vein, a, a, another quote that I has kind of been a lodestar on my life, and Warren Beatty, who great actor, film director, he said that I knew I was getting successful when I couldn't separate work from play. Yeah. So being, being a storyteller, a traveler, it really started with my mom, and being raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was a little boy, I don't know, six, seven years old, and she read me to sleep every single night with Grimm's Fairy Tales, King Arthur, you know, all these world adventures, mythological stories that are timeless, that live forever. And she said that when my eyes were closed and my chest was moving up and down, in other words, when I was physically asleep, she kept reading. And I think our subconscious is like a pilot light in an oven. It never really goes out. And they tell people, if you want to learn a foreign language, let the tape recorder run all night. Because even though we're asleep, a part of us isn't and still absorbs and takes in. So it was my mom who put in my ear and in my heart and soul the sense of story, the love of language, you know, the sense of adventure. And one night she picked up a book called The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Oh, man. And why in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, this industrial city, why that story resonated so much. But that book just really, really affected me. And then I spent the rest of my, you know, teenage years seeking out wilderness, trying to listen to The Call of the Wild. So where is the first venture where you know this young boy michael uh you know for the first time really ventures off into the great unknown like what was the the big first adventure for you well interesting thing was is my father was a professional football player with the cleveland browns where i grew up in the nfl back in the day and he never wanted us to be him we didn't have to grow up to be football players he said, whatever you choose to do in life, just be the best at it. And he was such a positive influence. He would come home and he'd say, the only four-letter word I don't want to hear from you kids is can't. You can do absolutely anything in life. 
So he was just this, you know, fountain of positive energy and encouraging us to go out there. But then he was go and my mother was woe because being, you know, from Italy, Catholic, superstitions, visions, you know, she was very much, don't live, you might die. You know, the, the constant worrying mother. And uh, so I kind of had that two dynamic thing going on. But I went to college for one year to the very same school that my father was an All-American football player at. I went on a football scholarship trying to be my dad, trying to please my dad. And I found out that the sensitive writer poetic side was more dominant than the athletic side at that time. So I quit the university. I gave up my free ride athletic adulation and I loaded trucks on a midnight shift with alcoholics and drug addicts to make enough money to buy a URL pass to go to Europe for two months on the advice of a, a friend. And that's what really changed my life was to travel in Europe see where streets are named after writers and artists. The respect for the writer and artist in Europe is as high as the actor or athlete would be in the United States. And that's on that trip, that's where I found my calling. So you mentioned there, though, that one of the big things you were trying to do, and I feel like a lot of us do this, is that, you know, you went to school thinking you had to be like your father and do what he did. It, how many people do you think are out there right now that are doing this because they're stuck in this sort of programming thinking that they have to do uh, what their parents did or they have to do whatever their parents are, you know, pushing them to do? Uh, I know in, in the Asian culture, it's definitely a very popular thing for parents to, you know, push their kids to become doctors. And like, that's the only thing they can do. And there's this, all this pressure in their schooling that they have to be this perfect person. Um, you know, how many people do you think are out there stuck living this way? And then what do we do to break that down? Because clearly it's not working. Well, you know, I, you are so that that's such a shrewd observation because I, I think I would say 75 to 80 percent of people don't live the life they should be living, but they live the life trying to please others, parents, you know, spouse, children, whatever. And it's sad. And I think when I'm in New York City, sometimes on a Monday morning, you see all those dead souls packing those subways going to work. And they're just lifeless because, you know, yes, they're supporting their families. They're doing the right thing, but they're not doing what they really want to do, what they really love to do. And to me, you know, life is school. We're here to grow a soul. And, you know, nothing should really get in the way of maximizing our potential as, as much as we can. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And, you know, you also mentioned about how your dad was go and your mom was woe. And I have one of those, too. I call her a Jewish mother. <laughs> uh, Jewish mothers and Italian mothers are the worst, I think. <laughs> yeah. So how did that, like, change for you over time? Because, you know, you went on this trip in, in Europe and obviously a lot of things have happened since, you know, was was your mom around to see you change into this person, uh, like change from the person you thought you had to be to the person that you were becoming? And how did that, you know, her perspective of, of you or other people's perspectives change of you as they saw you move out of, uh, you know, what you thought you were supposed to be and move more towards, you know, what you were naturally born to be? Well, I think no matter what stage of life we're in, what age we are, we want our parents' approval. And my father did not speak to me for a year, a wall of silence. And we lived in the same house because, and, you know, rightly so, I gave up thousands of dollars of education. I gave up, you know, this football scholarship and also to get a degree for free to do it the hard way, to do it my own way. And my dad couldn't understand that. So there was a wall of silence from him. And then, you know, my mother was a little bit more understanding because she saw the writer side, the sensitive side in me, and she knew that that was the side that I probably should go for in life. But to go to Europe by yourself and not have an itinerary or a plan 
again, you know, I'm going to get robbed and beat up and blah, blah, blah. But she actually took me to the train station, dropped me off there to catch a train out to the airport. But, you know, laying the guilt on me and the, you know, it was a rough one, you know. So right. I've learned that the people in our town want us to stay there. They want us to be like them. Our parents, you know, can be overly protective. And I've learned to follow a voice. And it doesn't come from my head. It doesn't come from my brain so much. It comes from my body. I call it the voice of wisdom. And this voice, it sort of emanates from my solar plexus. And I learn a lot from life through my physical self as much as my mental self. And it has literally saved my life about seven times. If we have nine lives like a cat, I'm down to about one and a half. <laughs> and this voice was saying, you have to do it different. You've got to go see the world before you get the mortgage and the kids and life comes at you fast. So I just broke away and not knowing what was in Europe. But the turning point was I was in Paris, France, and I kept a journal every day. And, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping in hostels. I'm living like on a loaf of bread a day. So I had enough money to afford the museums. And, and I'm scribbling in a journal in Paris, France, in the left bank. And there's this French couple sitting across from me. And they, in broken English, they invited me to join them for a drink. And I said, oh, I would love to. But just let me finish this, this one paragraph. And, I mean, I was a punk kid. I, I didn't have a writing style. I was just scribbling. And they looked at me when I said I was a writer with such awe and such reverence that it snapped my head back, hmm. you know. And then seeing, you know, the, the museums and seeing the streets named after writers, artists, the whole thing, I just got that whole different perspective that there are other important things in life as well as making money, being successful on a monetary uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, I definitely found that, and it's weird how this comes to you when you're on the road, when you're away from home. Uh, you know, when I first took my big trip and I took two months off from everything, um, you know, I still had my email with me. I was still checking it and responding to people, and I was, like, pre-booking work. So while I was gone, I'd have some work when I came back. And my whole thinking going into it, like, even as I got on that first plane was, I'm going to come back to nothing you know, I, I'm screwing this up. I'm going to have no money, no nothing. And when I got back, not only did I realize that I had like pre-booked enough work that I made the same amount of money on the road as I did when I was home, um, but I now saw the value in being able to let go of uh, that sort of monetary compensation. I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, let's be honest, there's still bills to pay. There's still, you know, money gets you and affords you many opportunities and experiences. But if you're only in it for the money, uh, you're definitely going to live pretty unfulfilled. That is so true. And, you know, one of my favorite authors, Joseph Campbell, a mythologist, in sort of his most important book was called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he just could assimilate all the mythology from different countries around the world, the universal themes. You know, there's only really about seven story themes. And, you know, we tweak them, whether it's a movie or a, a novel or whatever. They're, they're based on, you know, Emperor with No Clothes, Beauty and the Beast, you know, those timeless kind of myths. And Joseph Campbell had three words that I just try to tell everybody in, along the life's path, and that is follow your bliss. Because I really believe that when you're on fire with passion and purpose, you just emanate energy. That's what charisma is. That what's, that's what life is. It all comes down to the energy that we produce electrically. I sing the body electric, Walt Whitman. And when you're on fire with passion and purpose for what you're doing, people have no choice but to get the closed doors out of your way. And I think you have to find, whether it's a hobby you're doing, with something that makes time disappear when you sit down at the workbench or computer or building boats or whatever. And, you know, it was nine o'clock when you started and three minutes later you look up and it's four in the afternoon. Anything that can destroy the time space continuum, the way we normally think is telling you that's what you should be doing. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I wanted to, uh, I think it's important to bring up at this point, too, that many people when they're on this search or on this journey, uh, sometimes make a mistake, though. They think that, oh, if I just go somewhere else, like run away from whatever problems are occurring here, it'll fix things. And I think that uh, that's the wrong way to do it because everything is happening inside of us. Now, I want to make it clear, though, I think that adventuring and and learning more about yourself through travel is huge because it might open you up to figure out what's going on inside. But I think there's a big difference between thinking like you can get away from your current geographic location and it will fix stuff. I think that we have to look at these adventures as more of like we're opening ourselves up to experiencing the world. And through that experience, we learn more about ourselves and who we really are. That's it. And, you know, one of the things I built my life on, and I'm a real student of metaphysics and William James, a great psychologist, gobbled up all of his books and writings. And I'm convinced that nothing happens to us by accident, that we direct the movie from the inside out. And I, um, I know for certain that our brains are magnets and we attract what we are. And I don't think we attract what we want we attract what we are. What levels we are internally, spiritually, is what we manifest in the physical world in front of us. And I think it even comes down to manifesting a life partner, you know, a a girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse. That's what we get back. It's a mirroring effect. And I think it all happens from the inside out rather than the outside in. And you mentioned attracting a spouse there, and I know that you have quite an interesting story with that. And, you know, it, I'm sure that if we heard all of your adventures, we could be talking into next week. <laughs> but I'd love to hear kind of just a, a nutshell of like, at some point, you wound up on an island that you were living on for a little while. It may be like, it, I know it's tough, but catch us up from like, when you went on that first adventure to, uh, you know, a couple things that happened in your life leading up to winding up dateless on this island. Okay, I'll give you the, I'll give you the quick version. Um, I came back from Europe. I dropped, you know, I quit the university that my father went to to be the football player. I now knew what I wanted to be. And I think 90% is knowing what you want and then it'll come your way. You know, that's the tough part is figuring out that first step. You got to be precise and exact in, in what you're projecting into the universe. So now I knew I wanted to be a writer. So Indiana University has the best journalism school or one of the best in the United States. And it was founded by a World War II correspondent named Ernie Pyle. So I figure I better learn the rules of writing and communicating. And then later I'll try to break them as an artist. So I transferred to IU. But the interesting thing was is I got thrown out of the only creative writing course that I tried to take. Because the professor was almost like a prophet. And he said, Michael, he goes, get out of here. I can't teach you anything. He says, you're a natural writer. And he said, what do you have to do? He said, go, go live on an island. Go travel the world. You got to live life, man. And you got to write about it. You can't sit here in a classroom. I'm only going to stilt your style. So I was kind of shocked by that. Tried to live hard and, and study hard. I did get my degree. I go to Colorado. A woman came out of nowhere like an angel on earth. I really believe that there are people, emissaries, that cross our path. They might not stay in our life very long, but they introduce us to our future. They connect us to a job or a spouse. And there were a thousand people milling around in a meadow watching hang gliders come off the top of a mountain. Everybody had their head back and I bumped into a back. But why wasn't I standing 18 inches to the left or two feet to the right? I bumped into the back of a woman from Vancouver, British Columbia. She was an architect. And at that time, we fell in love. I got a letter a day. Oh, come and see me. But I had never been west of Colorado. Stuck out my thumb, hitchhiked all the way over to Los Angeles, all the way up the west coast. Spent two weeks on her sailboat exploring the inside passage to Alaska. One of the most beautiful places on earth that I didn't even know existed. And through Genevieve, I met a man who owned an island up there. And 
I was going to stay two weeks at his invitation, and I ended up staying two years, wrote my first book, published by HarperCollins, and Cosmopolitan Magazine in New York City got wind of the book and my crazy adventures, and every month they stick a single guy in there called The Bachelor of the Month. And I got 5,000 letters from women around the world, and that's how I met my wife, Paula, my true life partner. Wow. So, I mean, you know, it's just craziness. But I think yeah. it all started with knowing what I wanted, is I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know, you know, how that was going to happen. But I just kept beaming that into the universe, and I wanted Jack London. And when I met the man that owned the island, he had, you know, all that call of the wild stuff. So it, it just was keeping that current and broadcasting it into the universe, you know, the law of attraction kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. And so let me ask you this, because I think that, uh, you know, we have a wide variety of listeners to the podcast. Uh, something interesting that actually happened to me just this morning was someone reached out to me uh, who had read my book, but they said they were 50 years old. And I'm finding more and more people who, you know, I'm only 26 right now at the time of recording this, but I'm finding more and more people get into their 40s, 50s, sometimes 60s, and they look back and it's almost like they feel like they wasted their life because they didn't do this. What would you say to someone who has gotten to a later stage in life and is truly just now realizing, you know, I need to start living differently than how I have been for so long? Well, I would I would say to them, it's never too late. And, you know, I really believe that time doesn't exist. It's one of the follies of mankind. You know, there was a distant Roman Caesar a long time ago, declared our calendar that every 365 days, there'd be another strike against us called a year. But why didn't he pick 700 days? Why not 7,000? I mean, I know 90 year olds that are 19. And I know 19-year-olds, you might as well bury them in the ground. You know, it's just we got to throw that stupid number away because it's so limiting. And I would say, you know, to the 50-year-old or whatever thinking it's too late, it's like, are you kidding? It's like every day you could totally transform your life and, and make it happen. And, and if you just get out of that, that mindless time frame, of thinking that each year is a drop down rather than a step up, you know. And by the way, I must tell you this. I'm a little bit psychic, and I must tell you that you are a wise soul. You are far beyond 26 years old, and I really believe, Zephan, that you are an avatar. You are put here on this earth to help and to teach people. So you are doing exactly what you're meant to be. I really get that sense. And that's not coming from me. It's kind of coming over my right shoulder. It's like the universe wants that to be said to you. Thank you for sharing with that with me first off. Um, it's I think it's one of those things where it's always interesting to hear coming from others. You know, you, you make all this stuff and you put it out into the world and uh, you don't know when it's going to come back or even if it's going to come back or if it will make the difference. And uh, it's, it's certainly... It's cool to be in the middle of the adventure right now, you know, and to be able to look at it and say it has been a wild adventure and it's still a wild adventure and it's not going to be anything different but a wild adventure for quite some time. I think it's a really great place to be. And, you know, I call it the ripples in the pond. We all throw the pebbles out there and sometimes we don't even know how far those ripples extend outward. Right. I mean, the 50 year old man contacting you. Those kids that are so lucky to be able to have you as their leader to go through Europe, I mean, you are literally going to change their lives. And I kind of predict that there's going to be a few of those kids that will be in touch with you the rest of their life and your life because of what you were able to help show them during that trip coming up. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that because it's it's going to put me into a, a different environment myself and still being able to, uh, I think one of the best skills someone can have is still being able to retain, uh, you know, your person and, and who you really are when you're thrown even outside of your own comfort zone. And I'm sure you've done that quite a lot in a lot of your journeys because you've been you all know, over. You know, that's the best way to live. Because when I went to the island, and this is a wild island with grizzly bears and killer whales in the front yard, 
Before that, I had only been camping twice before in my life. I had nothing on my resume, you know. But when you throw yourself into the unknown, that's when we accelerate our growth. And we have all this innate instinctual knowledge that we don't tap into in the civilized world because it's not as challenging when you don't when you're not facing life and death situations here, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm I'm picturing that at some point in time they're probably gonna make a movie about your life. You know, have you ever seen? Um, I know you like Call of the Wild. Have you ever seen uh, Into the Wild, the movie or the book by John Krakauer? Yeah, that was a really good book. You yeah, know, I've related uh, a lot with that. That was something that resonates a lot with me and just seeing that story and knowing that it was a true story, you know, really makes all the difference there, too. Um, right. As we're rounding off this episode, you know, I'd love to hear there was something you asked me at the beginning about kind of your greatest adventure and most interesting adventure. Uh, so I'd love to round off the episode with, you know, what was your greatest adventure and then what was your uh, perhaps craziest adventure? I think the greatest adventure was meeting my wife, Paula, and how that happened in a way that was so, you know, being a Bachelor of the Month in Cosmopolitan Magazine, I thought it was a silly magazine. And and I'm learning that opportunity can present itself in unusual ways. And to be able to find a life partner, to be able to find your best friend, to be able to find somebody that you don't even have to talk together for hours. It, and when it's as easy as breathing. And, you know, I've learned that really you know when you're in love, when the other person's happiness is essential to your own. And to have that with another human being and to only have it get better each day and not to have a ceiling or not to have a limit to it is wow, you know. So that's a daily adventure that we keep adding to. And it's just phenomenal, the the depth and the joy that it brings. Yeah, absolutely. And then how about like the maybe perhaps wildest or, or scariest adventure? I think one of the scariest was coming around a boulder. This is in August when the salmon are running up in Alaska and there's bears everywhere. And I broke my own rule that I constantly tell people is you've got to make noise because bears attack in two conditions. When And these are bears that are nine feet tall. They can be over a thousand pounds. They're giant grizzly bears. Of course, when a mother has cubs, I don't know if you've seen The Revenant, the movie. Where well, it was, not yet. It was that situation where the Leonardo character, he sees two cubs in a deep forest and sure enough mom is behind him so she tries to kill him because she misinterprets his actions with a rifle trying to harm her children well in my case it wasn't the maternal instinct that kicked in it just was wrong place wrong time and me being silent there was a huge boulder and the salmon stream was so loud I couldn't hear the footfalls of anybody else coming down the trail so I round this boulder like a 90 degree turn and there is a huge grizzly bear like three feet away from me. If I had come around that boulder like a split second earlier, I would have literally run boom right into him. So a grizzly will attack maternal instinct, protect kids, and they will also attack when you surprise them. And, you know, any animal, whether you have a kitty cat at home or a dog, when they lay those ears back flat against their head, they're coming after you. And he did everything else. He clacked his jaws and he gave me the cowboy walk where they stiffen and bow their front legs. And I go, this is it. You know, I saw half my life flash in front of me. And I have a native teacher. She's an elder woman in Alaska. And she had told me that if you're ever that close to a threatening grizzly bear, you should sing to them. And I remember talking to Lucy, you know, in her kitchen and I go, sing? What do you mean? Why would you want to sing to a threatening grizzly bear? And she goes, they're not going to understand your words, of course, but the melody of your song might calm them down, put them in a diversionary track. So Zephyr, it was so weird. 
I mean, you have literally half a second to pull a song out of your own internal hard drive. So, of all the music in your internal iTunes, what pops out? But I couldn't even sing it because I was so fearful that my mouth went dry. It was just like cotton mouth. But out of my mouth I sang, if you can call it that. From a drunken karaoke night, a Neil Diamond song. <laughs> You don't bring me flowers, you don't sing me love songs anymore. The bear crashed away in pain. Wow. It worked. It worked better than a gun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I, I had to change my pants after that. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Wow, man. And you well, know what's weird is I have dreams ever since that close encounter with death, you know, on four legs, of being attacked by a bear in the woods. He's just about ready to, you know, bite into the arteries in my neck. He's got like two red embers for eyes. We make eye contact. And all I do is beam love. I pour love like maple syrup over his face. And we're dancing this Polish polka together through the woods. You know, that's wild. That's awesome. So well, maybe maybe if I hadn't a sang and we had hugged each other, who knows? We still might be dancing the polka up there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Michael, you've got a wild story. And, you know, I I would love to I think we should have you back at some point in the future, too, just to share some more. But um, for right now, I'd love to just share with everyone, how can people find out more about you? I know you've got a book out there. What's the best place for people to go to, uh, to learn more? Well, my long last name is kind of hard to remember or spell. But if they jump on Amazon and they just type in two separate words, Wild Life, that's the title of my latest book. And then it'll take them to my author page and I have all my social media websites and and I just love social media because for an author it connects you directly and I'm sure you know as well that it connects you directly to to readers and you know you can interact and answer questions and it's just so cool now to be connected that way. Yeah, totally. It's been great to, you know, meet people from all across the world. I mean, look, you you reached out to me over an email and, uh, you know, I had never heard your story before. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, man, I've got to talk to this guy. Yeah, I really believe we're kindred spirits. We're sort of on the same path, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, Michael, it's been great having you here. Uh, I can't wait to, you know, catch up more with you in the future and and hear some more stories. And uh, just want to thank you again for sharing uh, a little bit of your time and a little bit of your life with everyone. And uh, is there any sort of parting words that you want to just kind of give to everyone tuning in? Well, this just flashed across my mind when I was, you know, dating the girls with the Cosmo thing. And a lot of times, Women would say to me, hey, men know how to tune up a car, but they don't know the first thing about how to turn on a woman. You know, foreplay is what you do all day. And one of the biggest things I learned, differences between men and women, and it's just amazing. When you do this, doors open up. Is when you listen not to reply, but you listen to someone to understand. That, oh, it's just such a big difference. Because most of us truly don't listen, and especially men. I think when men listen, they think they're being subordinate, you know. But when you listen, not to reply with your own answer, but when you listen to understand, that's that's a big key. That's awesome. Michael, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, it's really been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, my pleasure. It's so great to go deep instead of superficial, you know, and Zephyr, let's keep in touch. I want to know, uh, I want to follow your life path as well. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you, brother. Hey, everyone. It's Zeph. Did you like this episode? Be sure to subscribe so that you can tune in next week and tell a friend about the show. If you want access to free training and exclusive interviews on success, happiness, lifestyle design, and adventure, visit me at yearofpurpose.com. Until next time, go out and let life surprise you so that you can live a life rescripted. scripted